Welcome to the Self-Funded with Spencer podcast. Healthcare is broken, and we aim to fix it one conversation at a time. Bueno, como estas? Me llamo Spencer Smith, el hosto de Self-Funded con Spencer. And that's all the Spanish I got. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. Episode 47, Self-Funded with Spencer. Of course, I'm your host, if you didn't gather that through my broken Spanish. Um, and you're here listening to Mark Testa again. Those of you that listened to episode 46 of Mark Testa, where we covered bone marrow concentrate, which contains stem cells. I had Mark stick around, and he was very gracious to extend the time. And we went into the subject for this episode, episode 47, of fasting. Mark is an expert faster. He has done numerous five-day-plus fasts. He's done water fasts. He's done, obviously, your regular 24, 48-hour fasts as well. He's done fasting-mimicking diets. He's studied and studied fasting and keto and all sorts of things that are directly related to that style of eating and that interval uh, style of eating, especially with intermittent fasting. I personally have also benefited from this in my life in the last couple of years. I do believe it's the strongest tool in a person's toolkit to, to manage your blood sugar, to uh, you know deal with uh, the inability to handle hunger cravings, to really stabilize your digestive system, energy levels, sleep patterns, etc. It is something that is deep within our DNA to be able to handle and respond positively to periods of not eating followed by feasts, right? This feast and famine style of eating that our ancestors did with hunting and gathering. And so our bodies respond very positively. And so Mark and I went into the science of it. We went into things like autophagy. We went into things like blood sugar stabilization. We went into things like mood and behavior impacts of fasting. Mark is well, again, well read. He is a chiropractor. He does a Approach this from a physician's lens and we just thought it'd be fun to share a conversation around fasting with two people that have benefited from it personally in their lives. We don't recommend it, of course, and we want to be careful to make sure that you do your own research, you talk to your own physician before you try it. Definitely don't go into a five-day fast first if you've never done a 12-hour one, uh, but I believe that everyone could draw some benefit from incorporating this into their lives to a degree. So fasting, episode 47, Mark Testa back again on the, on the show, self funded with Spencer. Hope you enjoy, and I hope this has a positive impact in your life, truly. Thanks. I'm I'm fascinated with medicine through food and the preventative nature. If we're going to solve a healthcare crisis, like don't just look at the back end of this, yeah. look at the front end right. of this, how we live as well. So, um, are we good to go? Okay, cool. Maybe I'll even include that. All right. So, Mark, we're, we had our bio breaks. We got some water. We stretched a little bit, let my leg uh, wake back right. up. Um, so, for those of you guys that are listening, there was a part one where I sat down with uh, with Mark and we talked about his experience with Regenex. He's an EVP. We talked about bone marrow concentrate, which contains stem cells. We talked about chiropractic work, et cetera, et cetera. And we got some of your backstory. But, Mark, before we get into the subject of part two, which will be mostly around the topic of fasting, really briefly, uh, uh, refresh people who you are again. Right. I'm a chiropractor, acupuncturist. I mean, I've been steeped in natural and alternative medicine for 32 years, largely as a skeptic. So I always wanted to find some evidence and proof, uh, or at least some um, historical information, right? If you even go back not too far, there's a lot of uh, information out there that, you know, natural medicines make sense. And we have moved so far away from that. Um, so that's, you know, sort of, and then I got into fasting maybe six or seven years ago, because there was a point in my life, well, low point, where I put on 50 pounds. You put on 50 pounds. I was 235. I can't even envision this. Man. <laughs> I'm just looking at you now. So seven, eight years ago, you, you put no, on No, this was probably 15 or so okay. years ago. Okay. Um, it was just a low point. I, was it stress-induced uh, eating, or what do you think? Uh, yeah, stress-induced, um, unconscious, just, yeah. you know, having fun. I enjoy food. I love food. Yeah. Kind of went overboard with it. Cool. So then, but you said it was about seven, eight years ago, you got introduced to the concept of fasting. So let's explain really quick, when we say fasting, what actually constitutes a fasted state for a human being? A fasted state is an unfed state. Okay. Really, it's not a starvation. It's not anything, you know, it's just you aren't eating for some period of time. It could be 12 hours, well, it could be 24 hours or more. Okay. 
really. So you're so not technically, eating. when you hear intermittent fasting with a target of maybe a 16 to 18 hour fasted state, that doesn't technically qualify by definition as fasting. Is that my understanding correct, or yeah, is it a gray area? There, there's a lot of different definitions okay. Okay. of that, but I'd consider that intermittent fasting. It's not the same as a multiple day fast at all. Okay. Yeah. Well, for sure. Yeah. And as somebody that does daily intermittent fasting, I would certainly make sure there was a distinction yeah. between those two. So we're talking about fasting or being in an unfed state. Um, and I really want to go into the benefits of this because I've anecdotally, again, we talked about anecdotes the last episode, but anecdotally for my own life experienced some very obvious benefits from, from playing around and testing a fasted state. So when you got introduced to it to seven or eight years ago, what was that trial and error period like for you? So- this podcast is brought to you by True Captive Insurance a premier medical stop-loss captive for employer groups ranging from 25 to 1,000 employees. True Captive believes in health care that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. That's why they take a white-glove approach, making it easy for employer groups to transition into a program built specifically for them. Check them out at truecaptive.com. This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at PlanSight.com. So I just went all in and did a five day water. Oh, fast. you started. <laughs> you went far. <laughs> so five day water fast, your first fast, right? Okay. Did you have some planning that went into it, or you just kind of went, well, "I'm going to do this and see what happens"? Um, I yeah, I was pretty much. Now I did my first fast when I was in chiropractic school. So okay. I was about 23, 24. I did a three day fast. I had an autoimmune condition hmm. that. I was like, at the end of three days, I was like, this is better. Mm -hmm. But then I went 30 years before I did it again because no one really likes doing it. Yeah. And I didn't enjoy it. Um, not to mention my neighbors were barbecuing a couple nights while and I you, was... And you're smelling it <laughs> waft over the, the fence, right? Yeah. Yes. But, there, that's funny how f- just the smell sometimes uh, can you literally throw all your discipline out the window when yes. a good smell comes through. So, uh, yeah. So I just jumped into a five-day fast, didn't really know what to expect, Um you know, you, and, and they're all different. I've done a lot of them now, but, um, you know, you go through hunger, you go through boredom, you go through, uh, you know, all you want. There's only one desire when you're fasting. You don't want a new car, a new house. All you want is one thing, it's, and that's food. Yeah. Um, and so you got to do a lot of mental dealing with that. Mm-hmm. How am I going to deal with it? And um, I remember on the fifth day, I was you get more energy, mm-hmm. right? I know people are like, oh, you're going to starve. You're going to weak. You're going to, none of that. The body doesn't work that way. The body starts producing other energy sources. And I felt really like high, high energy. And I lost 12 pounds. Now I don't want to five pick, days, in five days. Wow. And I had plenty to lose. Okay. So, um, and a, a lot of it in the abdomen, mm-hmm. right? That's where fasting really seems to target fat loss is in the abdomen, which is the worst place and the worst kind of fat to have on your body. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, oh, wow, this is cool. And then I started daily intermittent fasting. So we had dinner last night. It's almost noon here. Or, or cl- And yeah. I still haven't eaten. I haven't eaten either, man. The black coffee and water is my is my sauce. Yeah, <laughs> a little fist bump right here. Um, but, it, you know, I love the intermittent style fasting because it's a sustainable, uh, you know, what would you say, modality to, yeah. to eat. Um, not obviously fasting 24 hours and then I'm not eating every other day. Some folks will do the one meal a day, which I, I understand the benefits of that, but it's, it takes it as a little bit to the extreme yeah. as well. So I haven't quite gotten there, but the 16 to 18, sometimes 20 accidentally hour window of fasting is almost a daily thing for me as well. And I think the benefits are very clear. I do notice the energy. Um, I would say I like the fact that when I come to work in the morning, I'll have my coffee in the morning uh, sitting at home before I get ready. I'll come to work. I don't have to stop and think about breakfast. I didn't have to prepare myself breakfast uh, before I left the house. I also know, well, I'm just waiting until the noon window right. or so opens up and then I get to eat. So it's like hit the ground running the second I get into work. And my energy level is really, really high. I'm a little hungry right now. But then the discipline element kicks in where you know how to deal with that. So let's talk about that because I think that is one of those things where people just, if you've never done it before, having the discipline just to say no to food when you really want it early on is one of the hardest things to do. So how did you figure that piece out? Uh, 
Well, I remember one fast I was doing, and we, I realized we don't eat just because we're hungry, mm -hmm. right? I hung up a call. I was upset, and I immediately went for some nuts in the drawer. Okay. And I was like, oh, I'm not really hungry. I'm pissed off. Yeah, stress eating, yeah. So yeah. you have to have a high level of awareness about why do I eat? Am I angry? Am I depressed? Am I anxious? Is there something I'm trying to avoid? And so you start doing a lot of introspection and looking at that. And, and so sort of controlling those urges really do fall, can fall into our prefrontal cortex where we can actually make a conscious choice mm. to not do it. And then you have to also realize you're not starving. You're not going to die. Mm -hmm. The body was designed to go through this and, and then you find some hacks. And so um, some of those for me have been going out for a walk. Uh, some of those have been just sitting and meditating for five or 10 minutes and just chilling out. One of my favorites is uh, eating salt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you actually just eat a pinch of salt by itself or do you put I, it in anything? No, I just um, good Himalayan or Celtic sea salt or something, just not, you know, not grocery store salt. Yeah. Because sure. there's more than just sodium chloride in in these other salts, and table salt, minerals yeah. and stuff. So I will just eat it. Um, and that'll take the edge off. Do you do the, the large coarse grain of salt or do you do the kind of refined or uh, ground? Yeah, it's ground and I'll just take pinches of it until I feel satisfied. And, um, and sometimes, and you know, I'm not making any recommendations yeah, here. Yeah, well, let's be clear. Let's take our disclaimer right now. We are not advising anybody to do this based on just what they hear us talk about. Like, I want to make sure that's clear. But so you're, for you, though, for what's worked for you, taking that pinch of salt yeah. until you feel satisfied, you're going to, you're about to say something So awesome. one, one and, and so I think, I mean, I've eaten as much as one teaspoon of salt while I'm fasting. Mm -hmm. Um, and then everything goes away for me. I don't have any physiological reasons why I, I mean, maybe I'm a little deficient in salt cause I'm fasting and not ingesting food, but that has made a huge, been a game. Well, I, I do the me. same thing. I actually take a bottle of water, squirt a couple drops of lemon juice and then throw a uh, core salt into that and mix it up. And it's kind of my own version of like a Gatorade for, you know, cause you think about the electrolyte imbalance. I, I notice early on when I fast, especially in the morning and I'm extending it uh, throughout maybe the afternoon, yeah. I shed a ton of water because right. my body's starting to, it doesn't have any sodium from the food I've been eating or anything like that. And so that met, that balance is a little bit off, I think is why I'm shedding some, I'm literally peeing like every yeah. 15, 20 right. minutes. So when I threw some sodium back in, especially the first 24 hour when I did, all of a sudden there was that satiety that you were talking about where it's like, yeah. oh, okay, now I feel a little bit better because I added some salt back into the body. So is that, do you think that's somewhat of the mechanism why it works or is it a, a psychological thing for you? I think there's, that's, there's some truth to that for sure uh, with the salt. It's just you're not putting anything in. Also, you're urinating a lot because when you have carbohydrates, when you eat carbohydrates, mm -hmm. they make you retain water. And so when you're not putting more carbs in, uh, regardless of salt, um, you're going to urinate a lot more. Well, I think excrete. that's uh, Dr. Sean Baker talks about, he's the carnivore guy and he yeah. talks about adding salt into his diet, right? Because of he's, he's a total meat eater, literally only eats meat. And he's obviously deep into ketosis most of the time as well, but he adds sodium to his diet intentionally right. for that reason. So um, I think I want to talk about the why, right? We talked about the what, right? The fasting, you're doing five day fast, which I do also want to come back to and really explain how to properly prepare now that you know what you know. But why does fasting work? Fasting triggers a metabolic switch in our body where we go from burning glucose as fuel to burning fat as fuel, right? So we'll exhaust our glucose stores stored as glycogen, sort of, you know, uh, what ice is to water, just a different form, uh, stored in our liver and muscles. We'll burn through that in about 24 hours. And okay. then this switch happens mm -hmm. where the body's like, well, where else can I get fuel? From fat. Mm -hmm. And so these metabolic switches um, have a lot of uh, um, power to uh, help our brains function better, reduce inflammation. Um, obviously, you're going to burn fat, and that's where you're getting energy uh, is that from. the process of ketosis then? Is that when that switch happens? Um, so I I am I correct in, in yes. saying that? Okay, so can we explain that then, the ketosis, when that switch happens, what's actually happening to your body? So what happens is um, you're, you're going to start burning fat, and as a, a result of that, ketone bodies are released uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, number one. And you can measure this in your blood. 
and, and urine. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's when you know. But you got to go at least 24 hours till you get into good ketosis. Now, the last fast I did, and I measure this while I'm fasting, um, it can fluctuate. But like on day one, day two, it was fairly still low ketones, okay. um, maybe one, two millimolars. But by time I got to day four, I was at like 10, okay. just burning fat like mad. Yeah. And that's when you really start feeling really good. So it's that metabolic switch because we know insulin and glucose and these things just wreak havoc on our body. And most people in America, well, 100 million are pre-diabetic. So that's a 15-year runway. So once you're pre-diabetic, the average lifespan is 15 years? No, no, oh, until don't. you get a diagnosis, oh, until you get a diagnosis. Of, of diabetes. Okay. Okay. And so there's a long runway where people are like, you know, and I can look at them, and I'm like, you're on your way, man. Yeah. You yeah. just don't have the diagnosis yet. Um, and so we know that that rampant glucose creates inflammation, causes damage to micro blood vessels, like in the kidney. That's why people get kidney disease, um, damage to blood vessels in the eyes. I mean, there's just a lot of bad things that are going on, upregulating um, uh, cell signalers that are telling the body to grow. Okay. And so, you know, at, at some point, you know, we need to drop that glucose level. And so when we can make that switch, it makes And so that makes you switch, it mobilizes fat stores, right? So right. When we, we get, it's fat, fat adaptation, is that what you right. say? Okay, yes, so exactly. It's mobilizing the fat stores. And to your point, yeah. though, on fat ad adaptation. So it takes a couple weeks to do this, okay. intermittent fasting for a couple of weeks till your body really knows where to go get that energy source. Okay. So, right. It has to relearn, right? Yes. Maybe what it hasn't done its entire life, right? right? Even though, but I do, I want to talk about you, you. You mentioned something earlier that I didn't want to stop you, but when you say this is kind of what we're made to do, you know, I understand our ancestry was feast or famine quite a bit, especially when right. we we're hunter gatherers, there would be long periods of time between feasts, yeah. right, for our ancestors. So when you say we're kind of designed to do it, meaning that's what the body maybe is doing, is either prepared to do or is, would you say it's also the most optimal state in which to operate as well? Um, <clears throat> it's optimal for some period of time, right? At some point, you got to put some nutrients. So not on the extreme, right? I mean, right. we're hunter gatherers by necessity, right? right? Like you didn't go a month without eating because you wanted to, it was right. just because you couldn't, yeah. but the body could be prepared for something as extreme right. as that. So yep. modern day, we're not going to go to that level of extreme, but it might be an optimal state to at least introduce intermittent fasting for a lot of people or a periodic 24 hour fast, right? So right. intervals like that. Yeah. Um, why do you think that is, or what is, what is kind of the reasoning behind that might being way, the way we're prepared. To your point, design, like yeah. we didn't have access to food, right? Like y y there's food everywhere in our house, vending machines, mm -hmm. grocery stores, and we've taken advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And we've eaten too much and too often, right? So, um, and we have, and, and so we've moved away from that adaptation and, and it's just because food is so ubiquitous and we don't even have to go back to hunters and gatherers. I got a 90 year old aunt and I asked her, what was it like on the farm, mm -hmm. right? They did not get up and eat. They got up and tended to the farm. Mm -hmm. They would eat around 10 or 11. And then because they didn't have, you know, refrigerators and lights that were so ubiquitous like now, they shut everything down at like when it got dark. Yeah. They weren't cooking and going to the fridge and snacking because they just didn't have that. Well, that's it. So it's, it's funny then we were talking a little bit about propaganda on uh, other conversation. And one of the ones, the realizations that I kind of came to as propaganda was breakfast is the most important meal of the right. day. That got hammered into people, especially my age range as a kid. Breakfast, you got to eat breakfast. You got to wake up and have breakfast right away. It's the most important meal, literally positioning it as the meal that you should eat every day. And then now I'm looking at the antithesis, the antithesis of this is the intermittent fasting where you are, you're skipping breakfast. It's yeah. not the most important meal of the day. It doesn't mean the foods that people typically might eat, eggs and bacon and things like that, uh, aren't included in that. It's just the timing of it, right. which is the opposite. And I start unpacking, well, how far back does some of the food propaganda go? And I don't want to fully go down into the conspiracy realm, but you know, some of the things that we are taught as a culture, as a society, are actually the opposite of what we really should be doing. And I, that's where I, this realization where round fasting was one of those aha moments for me. Um, but so with fasting comes ketosis. You know, some of the other obvious benefits, let's talk about, um, you mentioned energy. Um, you know, maybe there's, what other uh, things are you looking at for physiological, you know, triggers or benefits of, of fasting? So um, this, this is pr published literature that I'll be 
talking about. So burning fat, that happens. A reduction in infl inflammatory markers. Mm -hmm. A reduction in insulin because um, most people are insulin resistant, uh, um, meaning that they – the glucose that we get just requires more and more and more insulin to mobilize it into the cells. And when the cells get full, um, the insulin moves it into the liver. Okay. And people get fatty liver. And mm -hmm. kids now get fatty liver. Mm -hmm. And that leads to liver failure and liver transplant. Mm -hmm. And then it moves it into another organ and then into the abdomen. So you got all this inflammatory chemicals that are occurring in the body. Um, people lose abdominal fat primarily as that spot. And let me just talk about that. Abdominal fat is pro-inflammatory, releases a lot of chemicals that upregulate inflammation, but in men releases um, aromatase, which breaks testosterone into estrogen. Okay. So, you know, the overweight male is going to have higher levels of estrogen and lower levels of testosterone coming from their own body. Coming from their own, as a result of that storage of fat around yeah. the abdomen as well. So if it can't store it in the organs, it starts storing it in the abdomen. Okay. And there's what are called skinny fat. Oh, yeah. The dad bod, right? Yeah. 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 Right. So because they don't have enough muscle to store it, they'll start storing it in the abdomen. Okay. So then, you know, I view this in, in for my own life, when, again, we're talking about just my personal application and understanding of it, the in inflammation is a big one for me, right? So I, we talked about when we're having coffee, if I eat bread, that is a trigger for me. There's immediate inflammation where the, the stomach sort of swells and gets bloated and distended. My pants feel a little bit tighter and uncomfortable. Maybe my back starts hurting too, yeah. because that once it's triggered, there's a, probably a 24 hour runway at least before that I get rid of that inflammation. And that was another kind of eureka moment for me is like, well, with fasting, I can kind of reset my digestive system. So right. if I did some damage the night before, let a little bit loose, maybe had some beer or wine with the wife or had some cookies, whatever it may be, I indulge a little bit. Worst case scenario is I knew I could kind of reset and undo some of the damage I did in the short term. And that inflammation was the physiological obvious event that happened as a result of bad eating. Mm -hmm. So, so when you like, is there a period of time where it takes for that, the inflammation to go away as a, re as a response to fasting or what? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I bet, you know, I mean, I, I haven't seen any data on this. The data I've looked at, it's been multiple day studies, uh, four or five days of fasting yeah. to see the reduction in inflammatory markers. But I, I would imagine you're right. There's probably about a 24 hour period. And you, you said this last night when we were talking, it's a great forgiver uh -huh. of, cause, yeah. you know, I'm Italian, I'm gonna eat good bread and I'm gonna uh -huh. eat pasta and I'm gonna eat pizza. I'm not, that's just, it's, it's in me, yeah. I, I, that's a given. But if I do that, I'll do a 18 hour fast and that right really resets everything and I can feel it and mm -hmm. I can see it in my face and my skin and my belly. Oh um, yeah, I mean there's mornings I wake up and you're like, "Oh, okay. Yeah, like I'm doing all right." Yeah. <laughs> but then there's some nights when you eat a really big meal and you look at yourself and obviously the water retention right. and things like that as well you go. Man, it's it's weird how much of a spectrum you can swing within a one day period just based on the way your body's responding to the food that you put in. Right. So ketosis, I think I want to spend a little bit more time on because sometimes that gets demonized. There's some people that do permanent ketosis or very long periods of ketosis, which I'm not necessarily an advocate for. But that is what you're saying is that triggering or partially this triggering. You could also go low carb or no carb to do that as well. But those seem to work in conjunction with each other. So why why do you think that is? So, um, again, because we're not burning glucose, we're burning fat. Mm -hmm. And so, but I think that state of ketosis is hard to maintain for 99.9% .9 mm -hmm. of people. So just intermittent fasting is adequate. So, you know, low carb, how long can we really do that before you want something sweet? Yeah. So it's hard to sustain. Um, some studies have shown just being in ketosis and eating that way is not really beneficial to the gut microbiome, okay. the, the flora that lives in and on us. And I, I think I mentioned this to you, you know, when you're born, you're 99% Spencer. Mm -hmm. At this point, you are 1% Spencer and 99% biome. Oh man. Bacteria, viruses, yeast. No wonder I things. feel different. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just, 
that's just a healthy human being, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. And so you think just because of maybe the restrictive nature in which you yeah. eat and you're obviously eliminating a lot of foods yeah. that you might not have as healthy of a biome, do you think people that do a lot of low-carb or eating or sustained keto ketosis are doing probiotics or things like that to reintroduce those things, or do they care or do they even think about it? You know, th that's a good question. I, I don't really know what others are doing, but, you know, fiber is what feeds the bacteria in our gut right? Not refined things, not just meat. Meat probably doesn't feed it much at all. Okay. Um, and so just by removing certain, too many things out of your diet, it's going to have a ripple effect throughout and particularly in the gut. Um, yeah. with lack of fiber. When I think, you know, there there are short-term benefits, and we talked about this last night as well. There's short-term benefits. I mean, uh, the carnivore diet is the extreme yeah. example, but the short-term benefits are at least in aggregate of anecdotes. I've seen a ton of them that people get benefit from it. My suspicion is that some of it is the elimination effect of you're taking all of those foods out of your system that have been triggering certain responses and unhealthy responses in the body. And so you just do meat and you can isolate just meat and the body seems to at least in the short term you get rid of a lot of really the right. negatives of the way you eat. However, you know, jury's out, I think, in terms of it being a lifestyle, long-term lifestyle. But I do understand why people do in the short term. One of the ones that I think you and I discussed that I'm fascinated with is the possibility for diabetics to actually get off insulin and things like that. Right. So talk to me a bit about the science around that. Right. So Jason Fung, a nephrologist out of Canada, uh, end-stage kidney disease of diabetes. And they'd come to him and he's like, what am I going to do? Yeah. You're already on metformin. You're on insulin. I don't know what else to do. Let's just take the food away from you for a period of time. And so he's shown, and he's written a lot of good books, uh, Diabetes Code, The Obesity Code, where he breaks it down really in understandable terms, looks at the literature, but just taking the food away from people because now there's no reason for insulin to continue to rise. Mm -hmm. It starts falling. And again, that switch is triggered and they start burning fat. And he has been able to help people reverse their diabetes um, this way through fasting, similarly as the carnivore diet. Because okay. again, you're not putting any sugary glucose carbohydrates in to turn on that insulin production. Um, and, and, and people are able to reduce, and that's what a lot of the study shows, reduce insulin so you and you see even use the term reverse, right? So there are instances where somebody can completely come off uh, insulin altogether. I mean, is that is that reversing diabetes uh, for some people? So Verta Health uh, in the self-funded space and in the cash space, that's their whole thing. Okay, is they do um, low carb uh, and have been able to reverse diabetes just with diet. Well, that I mean, that's one of those things that when you talk about. Um, you know, something that would, I would consider astonishing, right? Is if that is the case, right? And I think over time, it sounds like it, there's evidence to suggest that that is the case, but over time, you know, how many people could in theory come off insulin altogether, reverse their diabetic, diabetic state without having to be on drugs for the rest of right. their life or the expense of that, the expense to the plan and agri, and yeah. kind of to bring it back to what we talk about in this podcast, right? How much money could be saved if we did that too? But how do you, you think you infuse that on a group scale into an employer, right? Or can you, right? Are we overstepping our bounds as an employer to control or suggest what people should eat? I mean, I'm curious where that line is for I, you. I asked that on LinkedIn last week or a couple of weeks ago. And the answer was like, we don't go into the house okay. with the patient. But, you know, if they want to do something at the office by putting fruits and things in the... But I think you need a motivated person who wants to try something and do it. And I think if there's, if it doesn't cost anything to add to the plan and you only pay for it when you use it, it's appropriate to have that stuff there because it's not just weight, right? It is diabetes, it's inflammation. Inflammation uh, drives diabetes, dementia, cardiovascular disease, and arthritis. What are the costs around those four exactly. diseases yeah, yeah. that we're spending? And it's by eating. It's what we're putting into our body. It's not, I need a cheaper drug. It's not, I need a cheaper surgery. That's all day late, dollar short solutions. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I'm grateful that there are those solutions and there's good providers. But at what point are we going to get in front of it? Yeah. 
And how do we do Well, that? and a part of it, I think, is education, right? I mean, that's sure. one of the where I've kind of picked the route to go from my uh, standpoint is just free and open education. You know, I'm learning as I go. I'm not always right, but I do try to, you know, do my own research and investigate or at least ask questions yeah. and then uh, present ideas that I believe to be true, right? And then it's up to the person that's listening to decide for themselves. But, you know, I do think just br- more broadly speaking, we talked about some of the propaganda growing up that breakfast is the most important meal. I mean, look at the food pyramid, what the food pyramid is based on is right. is grains and wheat being the foundation of your whole diet and you're looking at that going man that's clearly wrong now that we know what we know yeah. um, but so that you know uh, there before we get into maybe who it's not for which is an appropriate way to take this for disclaimer purposes yeah. and things like that yeah. one thing we haven't touched on is autophagy and I really want to explain that that is one of my favorite reasons why people fast so could you explain to me what autophagy is autophagy so we have cells phagocytes so that and that's autophagy. So where our body is eating and consuming weak, dying cells, which we all have. And some of those, all of them use energy. They release pro-inflammatory chemicals and some of them will turn into cancer. Okay. Right. So it's good to get those cells out of your body. And when the, when, when we aren't feeding ourselves with food after about 24 to 36 hours, the body starts realizing there's this opportunity to consume these for fuel okay. as well. Okay. And di- start digesting these cells. And so that, that's really what autophagy is. Now you don't have to, you, you, you got to go at least a day plus, okay. right? When I do a four or five day fast, I'm also deep into autophagy as well as mm-hmm. ketosis. Mm-hmm. And, and um, I don't know of any way to measure that like in the home like I do with a finger stick, but, um, you, you know, you're cleaning house. And even if you do that twice a year, you're cleaning house. Okay. Now, the cool thing about that is the body, again, in its infinite intelligence knows that it's just cleaned house. Mm. And so the studies that are coming out of USC have shown that the body will release and mobilize from the bone marrow stem cells okay. to rebuild itself. So you get this boost of stem cells once you start refeeding yourself or eating. Um, so clean the house, body knows it needs to repair itself, releases the stem cells and rebuilds itself. And I'll tell you what, man, on that sixth and seventh day, oh my God, workouts are great. Your skin really? and really? face looks totally different. You got a ton of energy and you don't break your fast by eating a, anything big. I break my fast with a salad. Yeah, I, I noticed when uh, the first time I went near like the 20 hour mark, I was really hungry, and I had like a double cheeseburger and french fries. I mean, the worst thing you could possibly eat. I mean, my body was like, what are you doing? Right. Like, I got nauseous. I thought yeah. I was going to throw up because my stomach had shrunk, and, and I think also just to in- introduce some greasy bad food, and it was like, it was a terrible experience. So <laughs> I learned the lesson there. It's like, don't overeat when you break the fast as well. Yeah. So you said you do a salad or something Sa- like that. I, and I go mostly, um, you know, so, so super low carb. I don't get anything refined. I don't mm-hmm. eat nuts. I don't eat eggs. I don't eat meat. It's a salad. It's avocados. It's, it's stra- blueberries. It's olive oil. Okay. And I'll do that for a day to maybe two. Maybe some homemade oh, really? vegetable so soup. So it's an extended refeed then, I yeah, guess. Yeah, and easing back in. Because your digestive s- system is basically shut down. So your pancreas isn't releasing enzymes. Your stomach's not making acid. It just needs to be kind of soothed back into function. Kind of like fl- you flip on a computer and you hear it rebooting. Yeah. You know, they, I, I, you got to ease into it. And I, I'm with you there. Um, autophagy, though, you know, other benefits, right? You talked about the health benefits, the cleaning of the cells. Um, is there a, a renewal or new cells introduced? Is there another term besides autophagy that happens as well? Well, uh, that, my, that, my, was it what? Oh, oh, and the, the, so addition to autophagy, right, which is cleaning up a lot of white blood cells too, which is why we see people's autoimmune uh, symptoms improve with mm-hmm. fasting, is mitophagy. Okay. So where we're consuming and cleaning up the old mitochondria. The mitochondria in the cell is the energy plant for the cells. And uh, part of aging is we, we, um, our, our, uh, mitochondria start declining in function and in number. Okay. And so when we clean up those old weak ones again, then the body will rebuild some new, stronger, younger. I mean, it's, it's fascinating science, right? I mean, it's not just like, oh, you don't eat. And you, right. you said the intelligence that's inherent in the body as well is fascinating the response to this. And I think even the first time you do it, you, there's a, 
a little bit of an epiphany that happens of, of what's going on inside of you, which I think is super cool. I like the interoperability between low carb and intermittent fasting. I tend to actually, when I break my intermittent fast, I tend to go a zero carb, something like an omelet with bacon or something like that. I like to actually continue the ketosis if I can, as long as possible. So that way I can get into a workout at the end of the day. Then I'll probably introduce carbohydrates post-workout. Yeah. Um, I've kind of found that balance is appropriate to me, but they, they're very, um, it's very, I guess, uh, prepared way to do the whole day, if you will, which I kind of like. Then I know, even though it sometimes is routine, it's repeatable. Right. Um, and every day I know I can kind of control my physiological response to food and things like that. I have a pretty good sense of how I'm going to feel throughout the day right. as well. Um, one thing that I do want to uh, maybe, I don't know if we want to end here, but I really would like the, if somebody's investigating doing this for the first time and they want to do an extended fast, so let's call that beyond 24 hours, maybe into the realm of the five day period you're talking about. What should I think about before I do that? And who shouldn't do that as well, I think is important. Can I back up one yeah, step? Yeah, you, you certainly may. Okay. Yeah. So other benefits besides that switch, right? There's this other chemical cell signaler in our body called mTOR. mTOR, yeah. Uh, mammalian target or mechanistic target of rapamycin. That is a growth uh, signaler. Okay. Right? It's perfect for when we're growing, when we're kids, it gets turned on by largely animal proteins. Okay. And so when it's on all the time, because we're eating all the time, and we're eating animal protein, and glucose triggers it as well, mm -hmm. we're in a constant growth state. Mm. And that can mean weight, it can mean cancer. Okay. So I think there's periodic times, and that's where fasting can just like bring that, calm that back down. Also uh, intermittent fasting calms that back down. So uh, Monday night I ate a New York strip steak, but yesterday I was mostly vegetarian. Okay. Because I know I flipped the switch. And so taking a day to back off. Also, autophagy and um, gets triggered and ketosis also when another nutrient sensor, AMP kinase, okay. gets triggered. And that gets triggered um, when there is a lack of nutrient, lack of energy, lack of calories. Okay. So, you know, there's the insulin, there's the mTOR, and then there's the AMP kinase. And so these things are... And there's no black and white with any of this. So don't, there is not like, oh, I'm going to cure myself of whatever, because we need all of these things working in some kind of harmony. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but trigger that, triggering that, pulsing, that, that's what intermittent fasting is. It's pulsing it. Mm -hmm. So you're getting these turned on when you need them, especially if you're working out. Um, mTOR also controls the immune system. So you don't want that thing shut down all the time. Okay, gotcha. And you can't constantly be in a state of autophagy either because you're consuming and breaking down. So everything needs to be balanced and, and, and um, pulsed. I like the, pul the pulsing. I've heard that term applied elsewhere, but that pulsing term make, makes quite a bit of sense. Right. So, I mean, I appreciate you reintroducing that. I want to go back to that question, yeah. though, because I really want to talk about the execution of this. I like to go, what is the pragmatic application? How do I do it? Somebody doing it the first time. I had somebody kind of coach me through my first 24 hour and maybe even be an accountability partner. But what's the planning process look like for somebody? So I've taken this? about 200 people through this. I start with a 12 hour fast, okay. right? Everyone can do that because we're going to be sleeping. Hmm. And I want all of this to align with the circadian rhythm, okay. right? We have this natural inborn rhythm that it's just, it operates. And, you know, World Health Organization said um, shift work is a carcinogen hmm. because it alters the circadian rhythm, mm -hmm. right? Digestion stops after about 6 p.m., okay. right? And so you want to align all this. So I recommend people stop eating by 7 at the latest, generally three hours before bed. You don't want to put anything in, not a juice, not a cracker, not a cookie, none of that. What about wine? No. I'm kidding. I, look, yeah. I stretched it yeah. for as long I as I could, too. <laughs> you had that wine before 7 o'clock, right? Um, uh, and so 7 to 7. Okay. Right, you want to eat breakfast? Fine. Let's start there. Okay. Do that for a week, and then just add an hour mm -hmm. each time mm -hmm. till you get to a point. And th this is where you're becoming fat adapted, training your body to burn fat. So 13, 14, 15, you keep adding, and then once you get, and then what you're also doing is removing refined crap out of your yeah. diet oh, as yeah. well, because yeah. you can't do this and eat Twinkies and and things like this. 
Damn it. Twinkies are the vindicated <laughs> food for sure. <laughs> I know. And that, for everybody, that's the first food that people are like, that's the worst thing you can eat. And it's probably actually true as right. well. So then you start adding that. And then are you working them towards a stated goal of a certain number of hours uh, to get there? Or what, what it, with that plan you've done with 200 people, what are we working Usually towards? 16 to 18, 16 18 hours. 18, okay. Now, and women, I think, are a little different than men. And so you got to be careful about that. We don't want to, you know, there's a lot more hormones going on in women. Um, and so, you know, and I've watched my wife do this and work with some other uh, OBs who are familiar with this. And so maybe for women, it's 14 hours, okay. right? Um, and then if you want to continue to take it to the next level, then do a 24-hour water fast, mm -hmm. All right, Go from dinner to dinner. dinner and to sometimes dinner. I do dinner to dinner. It's pretty easy. You still get to eat. Mm -hmm. You got something to look forward to. Once you've got that down and you've done maybe one a week, one a month, Okay. Even of those and start continuing to train, train your mind. Yeah. What do I do when I'm hungry? Use some of those things we talked about. Then you can start to go for what I would go for is a three day fast. Okay. Because then you're going to get the autophagy. You're going to get deep into ketosis. You're going to really start burning fat. Now, out of USC, Walter Longo and his, uh, his um, team out of USC did a lot of research on the fasting and mimicking diet. Yeah. And they learned about mTOR, AMP, kinase, and they figured out what triggered all that. And so they've put together a five-day fasting mimicking diet. It mimics fasting, but you can eat. Yeah. And they give you all the food. It's 100% plant-based. It, none of it's refined carbohydrates. It's low, very low in carbs. It's high in fat, almost like ketosis. And, um, and that makes it easier. I can't say that it makes it a lot easier because you're still, you feel like you're doing a water fast. Okay. Because okay. your body doesn't think it's getting any nutrients. Well, and so what is the, what is the reasoning behind why you would do that rather than just a fast? Easier. It's, it is easier. And, and, he, easier, and then that's yeah. what he said. People just don't want to fast. Okay. If we give them some food, we can mimic the same process. Is that a psychological yes. thing you think? Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. like you said, you're not really eating much of substance where your body's saying, oh, thank you. I've got food now. It's just your, your brain thinks you're eating, right? Right. I actually remember watching a documentary a long time ago about a young man that was preparing for uh, a wrestling event in high school and they had to cut weight. You had to be in a certain amount of uh, a certain weight range to qualify for your weight class, right? Or, or you couldn't yeah. wrestle. Right. And he was doing something similar to that where he was like cutting up a half having a power bar, you know, I know, you remember those old power bars that people used to eat versus running? He would cut it in half and that's all he ate versus the, in the day, but he split it into two meals where he had it at one period and then later in another period because he was trying to cut weight. And so I think that was more psychological just to put something in his it, body. Yeah, for sure. But so there are, are there any downsides if you do the mimicking fast versus the, the full fast? So for any fasting, right, if your BMI is too low, below 18, I think, or 16, if you're, too, if you're under 18, I wouldn't recommend you do this because you're in a growth phase, okay. right? Um, if you have an eating disorder, mm. I, I would not recommend going down this pathway. Okay. If you're on insulin, you got to work with a physician mm. on this. Um, I've never worked with anyone on metformin, um, but I would be cautious around glucose sparing. What does metformin do? Because we've mentioned that a couple of times. I want to make sure people know what that metformin is. Metformin is a diabetes drug, and it helps the it makes the liver not go into gluconeogenesis, where it starts making more glucose. Okay. So, right, most diabetics have too much glucose, so we don't want the liver making more glucose with it okay. as well. So somebody that's on metformin should probably be cautious, or at least should speak be cautious. to their doctor. Talk to their doctor yeah. first. I don't have any experience, but um, but I'll get some. Well, that, okay, cool. And so I'm, I'm curious, though, like, this, this seems to be the fine line. You mentioned people with an eating disorder. There's always a fine line with these things where it gets taken to an extreme and it becomes uh, detrimental to a person. So you said somebody under maybe a 16 to 18 BMI, which means well, they're probably in the realm of being anorexic at that point, or, or quali under what would you qualify that state if they're not anorexic? What would that state mean? Underweight. Underweight, okay. Yeah. But on the verge, right, of being too underweight to be too, too, Right, too okay. underweight. And, and what we see in fasting is the people who have the most to gain from it get the most benefit. Of course, yeah. Right? Yeah. So they really notice a change in their body yeah. and body chemistry. Well, and I, yeah, I've noticed all those benefits, right? I think the, the reason I really like it, too, is the simplicity of it, right? There's nothing even to sell me. I mean, the fasting right. mimicking diet, obviously, there's a protocol for that, but... 
you just don't eat, right? You yeah. just have the discipline not to eat. So there's nothing to buy. If anything, you're actually spending less on food because I'm eating less often. Yeah. But there's a sustainability about it that really, this is a lifestyle. And sometimes I hate, I cringe at the, oh, it's a lifestyle choice or it's a lifestyle change. No, but it is. So this yeah. is something I will literally do for the rest of my life and is the easiest thing from a dietary standpoint to change in your diet, which is why I've been a pretty strong advocate for it. Right. And so you think this is something you'll, you'll yourself will apply uh, for your life as well? I will continue to apply it, right? I also look at a lot of the research, longevity. There's a lot of longevity genes that get turned on. Mm -hmm. Now, again, nothing black and white, Yeah. but with like two meals a day, right? And you got to make sure when you're fasting, intermittent fasting, is that you actually eat nutrient-dense foods when you refeed. You know, good fats, good mm -hmm. proteins, vegetable carbohydrates, things like this. But I think it'll be something I do the rest of my life. Well, I think so too. And then the one thing I'll bring it home with, didn't you say, and I think I remember this correctly, that there's actually a benefit potentially to fasting prior to the stem cell uh, concentrate procedure, right? right. Was, so maybe you're actually having people be fasted going into that Procedure, correct? R right. So okay. we, you know, and it's everyone's choice, but recommend that fasting mimicking diet. And then we'll do their bone marrow concentration procedure, you know, on day six or seven. Because in the study, again, out of USC, they showed an increased level of stem cells released in the blood. So you might as well take full advantage of that. So you got your natural production plus the reintroduction of your own concentrated cells. Yeah. That's so supercharges. I've been thinking, maybe it's because I drive a car that has a supercharger. I just love that word, but um, supercharge is what it seems appropriate yeah. there. So that's actually pretty cool too, because it comes back around for you and what you do in your work life as well. Right. There's an obvious connectivity. Um, so I, I really appreciate you going in. This is a bonus episode, yeah. man. We got to talk about something I'm very passionate about and you are as well, which we connected right. on. Anything you might might leave the audience with somebody that's totally interested in this, maybe a book or a video, something to watch to get started. Yes. So I'm glad you asked yeah. that. So I would check out a, a documentary by Doug Orchard called Fasting. There's a couple called Fasting, but the one by Doug Orchard where he interviews Walter Longo and Jason Fung. Jason Fung's books, uh, Diabetes Code and Obesity Code, also talk de a lot about this uh, sort of thing. Um, you know, a couple other hacks that you can eat, like if you were intermittent fasting today, olives. Olives, really? Olives are mostly fat. Yeah. And so, you know, five, if you really need it. But you got to be careful because sometimes when you're hacking that way, you get the gastric juices started and now uh, you're hungry. Yeah, I'm kind of, you know, for me, it's kind of an all or nothing thing. I mean, maybe me if too. I try to go the very extended version, I'll need to do something like that to get me there. But for me, it's just like, turn it off, don't eat, um, and just be done with it, right? right? Just have the discipline not to do it. So yeah. I appreciate that. I think it's always good when somebody has an interest in something to not kind of know where to go to take that next step to actually do right. it. Hopefully the, this podcast was beneficial to them as well. So again, thank you for your extra time, yeah. man. Thanks for coming yeah, down, Mark. Great, great to see you. Great to get it. to know you. And yeah. I can't wait to do this again soon sometime, yeah. man. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Spencer. Yeah. Thank you to our podcast sponsor, True Captive Insurance, a premier medical stop loss captive for groups of 25 to 1,000. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. Check them out at truecaptive.com.